Hi, this is Craig Stocks here at Utah Desert Remote Observatories. You can find us online at utahdesertremote.com. And today I'm going to talk about really just one particular aspect of astrophotography, and that is stretching. probably heard the term stretching a lot and what we do is just dig in a little bit into what stretching actually does and doesn't do uh, and to start with let's kind of set a basis any digital image no matter whether it's taken with your cell phone or a DSLR or an astronomical camera any digital image is going to be stretched and a big part of that has to do with going from linear to nonlinear. You may have heard those terms related to astrophotography. Uh, in standard photography, they don't really use the term linear and nonlinear that much. Uh, they typically talk about applying a gamma curve, which is the same as stretching. But all digital images get stretched. Uh, if you look at an image from a digital camera, the linear image, the raw image, is a linear image. And it's going to look, if you could look at it, it would look very dark. Um, raw images really aren't an image. It's data that you can make into an image. And one of the things you need to do to make it into an image is stretch it or apply a gamma curve. And that takes it from being kind of dark to nice and bright and colorful and easy to see. Now, that happens automatically when you take a picture with your phone or if the DSLR, if you're saving a JPEG. The process of going from a digital sensor to an image you can look at on a computer involves stretching, doesn't matter what camera or the source of the data. Now, stretching also happens, of course, with astronomical images. If you look at your raw TIFF files that come from an astronomical camera or even raw files from a DSLR, uh, they're going to look very dark, and when we apply a stretch, what that's doing is taking all of this data that's kind of jumbled up down here at the very dark end of the histogram in the almost black range, and it stretches it out into the brighter areas of the histogram so we can see it. Uh, you can think in terms of it just makes it brighter. But I want to talk a little bit about what's going on under the hood to help explain why the raw images look like this. So let me just look at this example in Photoshop. And let's just imagine, move myself out of the way here, let's just imagine that you have a camera that's able to record nine stops of dynamic range. Um, <clears throat> slide film was probably more in the five or six stops range. Um, most cameras today are going to be in the 12 to 16 stops of dynamic range. Um, so nine is a little bit on the uh, the older technology side, but it'll work well for this example. So I've numbered this, those nine stops of dynamic range from zero to eight. So zero to eight is nine. In terms of readings, uh, zero is no light, so anything that reads zero is going to be black. And you can think of this on a 8-bit scale, uh, the whitest white we could represent would be 255. If you think of it as a percentage scale, then this is 0 and this is 100% light. If you're working with 16-bit values, instead of 255, the brightest value you could represent would be 65,535. The point is that your range is going to be from no light to as much light as you can handle and the values, I'm going to talk in terms of 0 to 255 just because the numbers are easier to talk about. Now an important factor is that each stop is double the amount of light. So in other words, this stop 4 has twice as much light hitting it as stop 3. 5 has twice as much as 4 and so forth. That's what makes this a linear scale. If you're counting photons, if you count 128 photons, you would be here in at the bright end of stop 7. If you counted 128 photons, then you would be in stop 8. 
So anything in our 8-bit scale, and let's just make this stops rather than a smooth gradient. Anything that goes from 128 to 255, that's the brightest one stop of our nine stop dynamic range. So 128 to 255, we actually have 127 discrete values that would fall into that first half of the range. The second stop of information falls in 64 to 127. So now we only have 63 discrete values instead of 127. The third stop down is 32 to 63, so now we only have 31 discrete steps, and so on down the line. So you can see by the time we get to the, the dark end, and even the whole dark half of this nine stops of dynamic range, the information is not uniformly distributed. Most of the information is up here at the very bright end, and the least information is captured down here in the very dark end. Uh, and even if you have 16 bits of resolution so that you have 32,000 to 64,000 and so forth, you're still down into just a, you know, maybe a do few dozen steps difference in these lower dynamic, lower steps of dynamic range. And of course, in astrophotography, almost everything that's of interest to us lies down here in the dark end. And that's one of the reasons that bit depth and capturing lots of data is so important is we're trying to build up <clears throat> more signal down here in these areas that get very little signal and very few uh, photon hits. Uh, this is oversimplified, but the principle is correct. What happens during stretching is we apply a curve to this so that we start to spread out the values. We basically, we spread out the values at the dark end and we compress the values at the bright end. So if I convert this from the sensor reading values to RGB values by applying a curve of some sort, and if, then if we measure these values, we find out that this stop 8 or stop 9, the brightest section, actually has RGB values of 230 to 255. The next group down is 202 to 229, 175 to 201. So we have around 25 or so discrete steps within each one of these uniform steps of brightness. That's what going from linear to nonlinear does. It spreads out these values, and hopefully you have enough discrete values that you can, if you only have zeros and ones and you're trying to make zeros to 17s, you're going to wind up with just a, a band of information. The same way with this 18 to 48, you know, you would have just two discrete values if you only had eight bits of detail. If you have 16 bits of detail, then instead of one to two, this might be 100 to 200. Uh, you can basically work the math going backwards from 65, 535. Just keep dividing in half for each one of these nine stops. If your camera has 16 stops of dynamic range, which, for instance, an ASI 6200 comes pretty close to that, uh, then you would start with 16 of these and keep dividing in half all the way down. Regardless of how much information you capture, the brightest half, that brightest one stop, is always going to be in the top half of the data. And that's just the way data works. That's just the way the electrons work. Uh, going from 2,000 electrons to 4,000, I'm sorry, photons, 2,000 photons to 4,000 photons is one stop of light, and you're trying to capture 16 of those. So when you get into PIX Insight and start stretching, what you're doing is converting these sensor reading values to RGB values that are spread out more uniformly so that we can see them on the screen. So if I look at this image, this is the unstretched RGB image. The last thing I want to talk about is the screen transfer function because there's really two modes of doing an auto stretch in PixInsight. If we do an unlinked stretch, what it's going to do 
uh, this color image is actually made up of three channels, red, green, and blue. And let's just open all of those. So this is the blue with an auto stretch. This is the red with an auto stretch. And this is the green with an auto stretch. In this case, they don't look a lot different to us, but when you combine them, they do look a lot different. Now, when I do an auto stretch, it is stretching each one of these channels, red, green, and blue, each one of these filters, to a uniform brightness. So it's not stretching them the same amount. It's stretching them to a uniform brightness so that they're kind of evenly balanced. So if I go to my RGB combined image, if I do an unlinked stretch, it's not doing what we just did with each one of the R, G, and B channels. What it's doing is stretching each one to a uniform, I'm sorry, it is doing what we just did. It's stretching each one to a uniform brightness. And if you look at the sliders, uh, you can see in the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel, the black slider and the midpoint slider, and you can see that each one is different. So it's kind of doing an auto white balance when you do the stretch. If I do a linked stretch and refresh, now it's stretching each one of the images the same amount. Uh, and that's when you start to see this kind of a color cast. So it's important to understand and keep track of whether you're doing a linked stretch, which maintains the relationship of the relative brightness of the three channels, or an unlinked stretch, where you stretch each channel to a similar brightness level so that you are doing kind of the same thing as an auto white balance. In my next video, we're going to dig more into color and white balance and ways to control color in astronomical photos. Hope you found this helpful. I tried to keep this one short. If you have any questions, drop those in the comments. And as always, I hope you have a great day today and an even better night tonight under clear, dark sky. Thanks. Uh -huh.